in righteousness the darkness seems to hide his face I'll rest on his unchanged here to meet with us tonight. We're so glad you're here at Cross Timbers. If you're new with us, welcome home. We're going to continue to sing about who God is and what he's done for us. The lyrics are on the screen. If you don't know them, that's totally okay. If you do know this, let's lift it up. Let's sing it out. From the darkness I called your name And into darkness your mercy came Called me out, you lifted me up. How great is your love! For my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up. of heaven you step down to earth in a sin perfection you gave your life for us and we are amazed yes we stand in awe
shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no us down. We'll fight till we're found. Well, there's nowhere you wouldn't go. There's nothing you wouldn't do to draw us back to you, Lord. And it's a night right now. You're drawing people close to you. You're saying, here I am with open arms. There's a waiting for us to respond to you, Jesus. But I pray that our hearts would be opened to you tonight that our ears would be open to hear what you have for us. I'll be lifted up in this place, Jesus. We love you. It's in that name that we pray. Amen. Man, what a God we serve. Amen. Come on. Incredible love that he showed, that he continues to show, that he would bring us here tonight to meet with him. And if you're here with us for the first time, I want to say, Welcome, welcome home. We're glad you're here. You know what? You guys can, you guys can take a seat if you'd like to. You know, if you're if you're new, we always start with, with this music thing. A lot of times we just call it worship, but worship is just simply an attitude of the heart. Worship's a lot more than song, and we're going to continue here in our worship in just a second. And the ushers are going to come forward, and and they're going to receive our offering. And, and that offering is simply just another way that we can express our worship. We express it through song, through praises, through just declaring truth around ourselves and in our situation of how big our God is. A God who would come for us when we didn't deserve it, when there's nothing we can do to earn it, and he would freely give his life. And that's a God that is worth worshiping. It's a God who's worth singing to. It's a God who's worth surrendering our lives to. And and a small portion of that often is our treasure. And the, and the Bible tells us that, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so this offering that we're about to receive, it's simply that. It's simply just an overflow of the heart. And so if, you, if you've never given before, if you give just out of obligation or if you give for a tax write-off, I don't know what it is. I would encourage you to, to maybe flip that around and just understand that there's so much more to it than that. It's an opportunity we get to say thank you, God, for for all that he's done. So I'm going to pray over us, and then we're going to receive that. God, I thank you for tonight, for all you're doing in this place, for all you're going to continue to do, Father. Thank you for the opportunity we get to worship you, God, to serve you, to honor you, God, to give back a portion of what you've given us to you, Lord. I ask that you would bless the people that are here tonight, bless as they give, God, and be glorified in this place, Jesus.
Have you ever tried looking at things upside down? There is always another perspective, a different way to play the game. If a challenge has put you on high alert, try to alter your perspective. If you don't know which way to steer, find comfort in knowing you can reset your course. Or the person you thought was a monster might actually turn out to be one of your closest mentors. If you notice people around you live in a silent world, try to stop and listen. And the moments that are most severe might be an opportunity to stand up and serve. When a person seems like a hater, think about how you can help to heal their heart. When you need to change perspective, just remember the power of words. The way you use them can make you a game changer. Well, hello everyone, how are you doing today? Well, it is so good to be with you. My name is Jamie Mullins, and I'm one of the pastors here at Cross Timbers. And I just want to say welcome home to those of you who are joining us online. I'd like to say hi to my friends in Argyle and those that are joining us on Sunday at Denton. And I'd like to say a special hello to my friends at the Lake Cities campus. I'm so honored that you would choose to come and worship with us this weekend. And I have loved these past few weeks that we've taken a look at words that have the power to change our life. And while I've loved the last few weeks, I've got to say that I think that I get to teach on the best of the seven words. It's a word that we begin teaching our kids from the moment that they learn how to talk. It's a word that I have seen have impact on my life in so many positive ways. So do you want to know what that word is? Yes. It's thanks. Thanks. It's part of our everyday vocabulary, but I think that there's a difference between saying the word thanks and living a life that says thanks. And especially when everywhere that we look today, we find negativity. So why is living a life that says thanks so important? Well, if you were to do a Google search, you would find hundreds and hundreds of articles that will tell you about the positive impacts that living a life of gratitude will have. And there was one particular article that jumped out to me. It's a Forbes magazine article. And they gave a top 10 list of scientifically proven benefits to living with a life of gratitude. And at the top of that list were having more friendships. And they didn't say that it was just going to be that you'd have more friendships, but that the quality of the relationships that you have will be improved. They said that you will have improved physical and mental health. That with living a life of gratitude, you'll see an increase in your self-esteem. But at the top of that list, my very favorite, and for all the moms in the house, you will give a big amen for that. Living a life of gratitude will give you better sleep. Who can sign up for that program? I love it. Better sleep. And you may be saying, Jamie, that's great, but I don't necessarily trust Forbes magazine. Well, we don't have to look any further than scripture to see the impacts that living a life of thanks can have on our lives. And as I was studying the word, I also found this contrast between what living a life of thanks will do for us and then what happens when we allow negativity and complaining to creep in. And so I wanna look at two passages from Proverbs that show us that contrast. The first is from Proverbs 17, verse 22, and this is from the message version. It says, a cheerful disposition is good for your health. Gloom and doom leave you bone tired. There's tired and then there's bone tired. And for those of you who have had kids, you know that feeling where you're so exhausted that it literally hurts to get out of bed. Then if you were just to skip up just a few chapters to Proverbs 14:30, we read that a heart at peace 
gives life to the body. But envy, or as another version of the Bible says, run away emotions, rots the bones. Rotting bones, that does not sound very pleasant to me. And so I hear these verses and I'm challenged because I don't wanna be bone tired or have rotting bones and I want to live a life that says thanks. But I gotta tell you, it's challenging. And just by nature, I am a person that typically sees the glass as half full. I'm the silver lining girl, but my own personal struggle has been that I fight this desire to want something different, something more, something better. And so because of that, I'll find myself complaining about not having enough. And so I battle this feeling like the grass is greener on the other side, but as a good friend once told me, even if the grass was greener on the other side, I'd have to mow that side too. And so I want to live a life of thanks, but it's hard. And I'm gonna tell you, this might not make a bumper sticker anywhere, but living a life of thanks, it's gonna require work on our part because it's so countercultural. I mean, everywhere that you look, people are wanting to be critical and pick things apart. And they're pointing out the things that are wrong instead of the things that are right. And so if we're going to live a life of thanks, it's gonna require some work on our part. I I was thinking about some things about complaining. It's become almost an art form, am I right? So if you were to go and have a conversation with just about anyone in the state of Texas at this moment, at some point in the conversation, the conversation would probably flip to the weather. And what would people say? Everybody tell me, people in Lake cities, I can see you. Yeah, that's right. They would say that it's too hot. But if I was to rewind back to the spring, probably in about April, in just about every conversation that I had, people would say, oh my goodness, I wish it would stop raining, it's just too wet. But just think about what's gonna happen about five months from now, winter's gonna come, and everybody's gonna be saying, it's too cold. (laughs) Yeah, so we just can't seem to get it right. There are so many things we complain about. I'll give you a few examples from my own home that maybe you can relate to. So, During the school year, my kids will come in from a full day at school and they are just famished, like starving, have to have something to eat. And so they'll run to the pantry and open it up and it is stocked. They'll open up the refrigerator and it is full of food. And yet I'll hear them calling from the other room, Mom, there's nothing to eat. Or later that night, we'll sit down and we'll watch TV and we've got over 150 stations that we've got access to. And yet the four of us will sit on the couch and say, there's nothing to watch. Or ladies, how about this one? Anybody else walk into their closet and touch hundreds of articles of clothing and yet walk out and tell your husband, I've got nothing to wear. No, just me. (laughs) So I think we can agree that complaining has become a norm in our society. And yet living a life of thanks, scripture tells us it's better. So where do we start? How do we shift to living a life that says thanks? I wanna start with a story in in the book of Luke, and it's a story about 10 men who had a radical encounter with Jesus. And so if you've got your Bible or your smartphone, I'd encourage you to take it out. We're gonna be in Luke's gospel account. It's the third book of the New Testament, and we're gonna be in in, um, chapter 17. I'm gonna be starting in verse 11. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity on us. So just a quick recap, before we go any further in the story, I wanna ask you guys a question, maybe picked up on it. How many lepers were there? There were 10 lepers. So the passage tells us that they were crying out to Jesus from a distance. And the reason they had to cry out to him from a distance is because in that day and time, leprosy was considered by law to be unclean. And so if you had leprosy, you were literally outcast from society. You couldn't go near anyone who was considered clean. And if you were to go near people, you had to shout from afar, unclean, unclean. Can you even imagine how they felt? Living most of their life completely isolated with no other relationships. And so they see Jesus at a distance and they realize this is our chance. 
They've heard about all of the miracles he's performed. They know that he has the power to heal, and so they say, this is our shot, we're gonna go for it. So let's pick up with them in verse 14. When he saw them, this is Jesus, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So 10 lepers came to Jesus asking for him to change their circumstances that day. 10 lepers were healed and their bodies were made whole. 10 men went from being outcast and rejected to having the hope of a new life and a new future. 10 men received exactly what they asked Jesus for. And yet, only one came back to worship him and to say thanks. Y'all, I don't know about you, but I want to be the one in 10. I wanna be the one that when everyone else is going along with business as usual, that I am saying thank you for the gracious gifts you have poured into my life. I want to be the one that declares thanks to God, not just with my words, but through my actions. So how do we do that? I've got two simple phrases for us today, and they're so simple, in fact, that I'm hopeful you'll remember them as you leave today. And these two phrases, I think that if we can take hold of them, we can move towards living a life of thanks. The, th the first one is that we need to repeat to remember. We've gotta to repeat to remember. Let's all say that together, repeat, repeat to remember. As I was studying for this message, I was looking through the book of Psalms and I noticed that there was a particular phrase that came up 17 times in the book of Psalms. And any time I notice repetition, it causes me to pause and do a little digging to see why it's there. So 17 times you will find this phrase, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. I think that the psalmist wrote those words because he knew that repeating that phrase had power. And he knew something that's still true for us today. You've probably heard our lead pastor Toby say this before. He's told us that we, we tend to forget what we ought to remember and we tend to remember what we ought to forget. And so the psalmist was writing these words so that as God's people were facing difficult circumstances, when they felt isolated and alone, when they didn't know which way to turn, they were in the habit of repeating God's goodness and saying thanks to him so that when they were faced with challenges, they knew where to turn. Because the truth is, every good thing in our lives that we have comes from God. God is good by his nature. He can be only good. He can never be not good. And so when we can wrap our minds around this, when we can understand that every good gift that we have comes from him because he's good, we're gonna have a shift in our attitude. We're gonna move from a heart that feels entitled to a heart that overflows with thanks. And I think that for us, we've got to develop ways that we can repeat to remember. We may not have the Psalms, but there are some things that we can do that will help us to repeat to remember. One thing that's been helpful for me, I had a friend remind me earlier this summer that journaling is a really great way to remember God's goodness in our lives. And it's become a monument of sorts for me over the past few months and just writing down all of the things that God is doing in my life. And I do mean all the things. As a type seven on the Enneagram, um, for those of you who don't know what the Enneagram is, it's a trending personality test. It's not going anywhere. It has been a radical life changer for me, um, and I love it. So any other Enneagram friends in the room? It's, yeah, it's been great. So knowing that I am a type seven, my tendency is to only write down the feel-good moments in my life, the happy moments, the mountaintop exciting things and the reason for that is because I want to avoid pain. But what I'm learning is that it's the moments that I am at my wit's end. 
that I feel like I'm in a valley and I don't know where to turn, that I'm crying out to God to move on my, my behalf. Those are the moments that I need to document because it's in those moments that I can most often see God's faithfulness, but it's not usually in the moment. I wish that I could say that I could always see God's goodness and faithfulness through the windshield, but I most often see it in the rearview mirror. And so as I've, as I've worked on this discipline of journaling and of writing down all that God's doing in my life, it's helped me to repeat over and over and over his goodness in my life. I know journaling isn't for everyone, so maybe for you, it's starting tomorrow before your heat, feet even hit the floor to just make a list mentally or out loud or writing it down, all of the good things that God is doing in your life. As I was reading through all of these psalms that um, repeat God's goodness, there was one in particular that jumped out to me, and it was because it reminded me of where we've been as a church this year in our 40 series, and about the Israelites' journey from Egypt to the Promised Land. And so I want to read it to you. I'm just going to read a portion of it. This, this chapter is about 30-something verses long, and I want you to look for the repetition. I'm going to start in verse 3, and I'm going to skip around a little bit, but don't worry, it's going to be on the screen, so you don't have to worry about following along with me. It says, give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder, his love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, his love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea, his love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. That's some major repeating, y'all. The author was so focused on the goodness of God and his love that it helped them to repeat his goodness and his love for them so that they were able to remember and to live a life of thanks. I have loved digging into the Psalms this summer because they're like the worship songs of that day. And worship is my favorite part of our service every week. And don't get me wrong, I'm so grateful for our amazing pastor Toby and his gift of teaching. And we've got an incredible teaching team here, but I never want to miss worship. There is something that changes in my heart when we declare who God is in this place. When we're singing about the reckless love of God and that there's no limits that he wouldn't go to for us, something changes in my heart. I immediately forget about the fight that I had with my husband earlier in the week. I forget about the challenging conversation at work or the betrayal of a trusted friend because when I'm in his presence, my perspective shifts. And that's the second phrase that I want us to remember, that praise brings perspective. I wanna share something with you that may not make your top five quotes list, but the truth is, God doesn't need our praise. We don't have to worship him to make him happy or to satisfy some sort of spiritual checklist or get him to do something that we're wanting him to. In fact, if we were to look back at this passage in Luke, we find they, the lepers didn't need to do anything in order for Jesus to heal them. He healed them because they asked. And in fact, I think he, he notices that the other nine don't return, and it's because he knows what could have happened in their lives if they would have returned to praise him and to thank him. I want to look back at, at this passage in Luke, verses 17 through 19, where Jesus asks, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. So all 10 lepers left Jesus that day and they were healed in their bodies. But I believe that only one had a change of heart. Only one ran back to Jesus to praise him and to say thanks. And because of that, he decided to follow Jesus with his life and in turn, he found freedom, not just in his body, but in his soul. 
Praise does something to us. It's a powerful way to show God how grateful we are for who he is. And regularly worshiping him and spending time in his presence, it helps us to realize how he's working in our lives. It gives us a new perspective. Our minds are transformed and our attitudes are renewed. And just so you know, praise, being in his presence, it doesn't stop when we stop singing songs here at church. Praise is simply spending time in his presence. It's an attitude, a heart attitude that says, God, I need you. I can't do this without you. God, I love you. It's it's a heart attitude, and it's going to overflow into every area of our lives. I want to share a personal story with you guys about a time that I got to experience what happens when we have a perspective shift. Um, a few year, a couple years ago, my husband and I went to New York City for our anniversary, and um, it was an incredible trip. The food in New York, if you've never been, it is incredible. All of the Broadway shows were better than I had imagined. Um, I got to check off a bucket list item by going for a run in Central Park. And then the moment to top all moments, we were able to get tickets to the Jimmy Fallon show for his rehearsal on the day that Justin Timberlake was there. What? Like, I had a lot to be thankful for that trip. But it all changed as we got ready to get on the flight to come home. As we walked into the airport, we're getting closer to our gate, and I noticed that there was a lot of extra security hanging around our our little part. And I was like, huh, this is interesting. Maybe, you know, this is New York. I guess they just take security really seriously. So I was like, this is good. And something to know about me, I, I love to travel. I prefer to fly than to drive. So I'm not a nervous traveler. So I was just thinking, okay, it's all right. They're just doing their job. As we get closer to the gate, I noticed that they're asking everybody for their IDs again, and I I see some commotion happening behind the ticket counter, and then all of a sudden, I see an officer run out to the ticket attendant, and he says, you can't let them on the flight. Didn't you see what it said? And I was like, oh, okay. Little warning lights start to go off. Um, I look at my husband. I'm like, are you sure we should get on this flight? We could change our minds. We could stay a little longer, take a later flight. It would be okay. He's like, Jamie, it's fine. We're going. We're getting on the plane. So we proceed to get onto the plane and sit in our seats. And we aren't there more than a couple of minutes when all of a sudden a TSA official comes onto the plane and removes a couple of people from the flight. So at this point, my warning lights are going from just little little sounds to full-blown blaring like this is not a good idea you should get off of this plane and it gets worse we're getting ready to go and all of a sudden I see cop cars racing towards our plane and officers coming on to talk to our flight attendants and so when I tell you that I was in full-blown panic y'all my heart was racing my palms were sweating I couldn't think straight and I just knew that this flight was going down About halfway through, I look over at my husband, and he's watching this comedy, and he's dying laughing. I was like, what is wrong with you? You're supposed to be panicking with me. We are not okay. And he's like, Jamie, don't worry. I'm like, don't worry. We're going to die tonight. How can you say not to worry? And then I see a man stand up. One of the gentlemen who had previously been removed from the flight later got back on, walked to the back of the plane. And not two seconds later, I see another man stand up, and I knew that he was the air marshal on the flight. He didn't have a police badge on. He didn't have anything that, that marked him as an official security officer, but I knew. And there was something about his presence that changed everything. All of a sudden, I went from being doom and gloom and thinking that I'm going to die to now I can rest easy and for the rest of the, I think I even slept for a little bit of it. And it was, it, nothing on that flight changed. Nothing at all. But everything changed for me because I was aware of his presence. And there's something that happens, y'all, I know this is dramatic, but I really thought I was going to die on that flight that day. I was thinking about that I was never going to see my kids again and there were so many things I wanted to do with my life. And so once I knew that I was safe, I was thanking God for so many things that I had taken for granted just a few hours before that. I was saying, thank you, God, for for my kids. Thank you for our beautiful home. Thank you for my family. 
all of them. Thank you for my spiritual family. I thank you, God, I thank you, thank you. And when we got off the flight, I literally wanted to run out and kiss the ground because I was so grateful to be alive. Nothing changed when I got off of that plane. I hadn't received a big promotion at work. I hadn't inherited a bunch of money. I still had relational struggles. There were still bills waiting for me in the mailbox when I got home. I still had this nagging ankle injury that was keeping me from doing some of the things that I loved. So none of those things changed. But because I had a perspective shift, I was able to be grateful for all of the gifts that God has poured into my life. I wonder what that might look like for you today. Maybe for our high school or college students, you would go from saying, man, I'm so sick of that old jalopy car that I got out in the parking lot, to saying, God, I'm so grateful that I have reliable transportation. Or maybe you would go from saying, I'm so tired all the time, and my house is always a wreck, to saying, God, I'm so thankful that I have a spouse that loves me and kids to take care of, and I'm so thankful that I have a house to keep up with that's always a wreck because there's always, there's so much good things that are happening in this home. Or maybe you would go from saying, I'm so busy all the time, I'm busy, 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 to saying, God, I thank you that I've got people to care for, that I have friends, that I've got places to be, and that I've got people that I can serve. You guys, God's given us so many gifts. If you're sitting in this room tonight, just a few of the things that we have to be thankful for. He's given us his Holy Spirit to comfort us, to convict us, to guide us. He's given us his word to direct our steps. If you're part of Cross Timbers, whether you're watching online or you're sitting in this building tonight, we value spiritual family. And so God's given us the gift of, of relationships with people who want God's best for us. He's given us health to bless us, and he's given every single one of you gifts and talents that you can use to glorify him. And you might be saying tonight, well, Jamie, that's really easy for you to say. It's easy for you to say, be thankful, be grateful. You've got everything going for you, but you don't know what I'm facing, and I don't. I don't know what challenges you're facing tonight, but I do know that God is good, and he only wants good for your life. I think about stories in the Bible like Daniel, Daniel was thrown into a lion's den for praising God. He was surrounded on every side by lions, and yet he continued to praise God for who he was and for his goodness. I think about Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, another story in the Old Testament where these three men are punished for worshiping God, and they are thrown into a literal furnace, and yet we find them worshiping God in the midst of the fire. So today, you may feel like you're surrounded by lions on every side. You may feel like you are walking through a fire. But I can tell you that when you repeat God's goodness so that you can remember it, when you praise him, you will have a perspective shift and you will, he will show you how good he is and the good gifts that he's given you. I wanna challenge us this week not to just take in information but allow God to transform something in our lives. And so there's a couple of simple ways that we can do this. One way would be that tomorrow morning when your feet hit the ground, make a list of five things that you're thankful for, five things. It could be a warm bed, a loving spouse, a great job, a specific friendship, maybe part of your personality that you love, but think of five things that you can thank God for tomorrow. And then I wanna challenge you to take that a step forward and to set little appointments in your phone. I, I've started, as I've been preparing for this message, I don't ever wanna ask you guys to do something that I'm not doing myself. And so I've set little mini appointments throughout my day to just stop and pause and have a moment to reflect on what God's doing in my life. So I would challenge us to do that. And I know that as we do these things, we're gonna have a life change. And because, because we live a life of thanks, we will become the one in 10, and we will be game changers. I wanna pray for us, and then we are going to take some time as a family tonight to say thanks. We're gonna take communion, and it's just an opportunity for us to say thank you to Jesus 
for what he's done for us. Because regardless of what we're going home to tonight, we can be thankful for a savior that was willing to go to a cross, who, was, who died, was buried, and raised again three days later so that we could be in relationship with him. And so after I pray for us, our ushers are gonna make their way forward and, and tonight, you don't have to wait for anybody to say anything. They're gonna give you a cracker and a cup of juice. And after you've had a moment with the Lord to just tell him thank you for the gifts that he's given you, you can feel free to take communion at any point that you're ready. Maybe circle up with some people that you're with and just share a moment of thanks together. So if you guys would, I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed, no matter what room you find yourself in. And if you would, if you'd say, yes, I'm sick and tired of all of the negativity. I'm sick and tired of my own negativity. And I want to be the one in 10. I want to be the one who chooses a life of thanks when everyone else is going on with business as usual. I want to be the one that comes back and praises God. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? I want to pray for us. God, I thank you for all of these hands that I see and all the ones that I don't. God, I'm, I'm praying that you would give us tonight a heart of gratitude. God, I'm asking that you would come and do a healing work in our hearts. God, we want to be the one in 10. We don't want to go along with business as usual. God, we, we want to have a heart that says yes to you. God, may we see the enormous blessings that you have given us. God, would, be, would we be willing to spend time in your presence so that our perspective will shift to you, to your goodness? God, I thank you for what you did for us by sending your son 2,000 years ago. Lord, so that no matter what we face, God, we have a gift of eternal life in him. And so God, tonight we say thank you for your gift of your son. God, we say thank you that tonight we have eternal life in you. And so God, tonight as we take communion together as a family, Lord, I just pray that this would be a moment that we can sit in your presence and allow you to radically shift our perspectives as we say thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All things have passed away and your love has stayed. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. And things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. And you cause your son.
lift that up one more time, declare it to him. For Jesus, we love you. We respond to you. Oh, how we love you. This is how we say thank you, Jesus. You are the one. That's the way we can respond to him, to choose joy, to choose thankfulness. It's a powerful message tonight. Thank you, Jamie. It's a good night. God's moving, and I don't think he's done. If you, if you want to pray with somebody, if you've got something on your heart, something you want us to, to partner with you in, we're going to have our prayer team up here at the front. You're more than welcome to come down and, and receive prayer with them. And if you're new with us, once again, we're so glad that you came. There's, there's a lot of next steps beyond what's happened tonight. Maybe God did something really incredible in your life. Maybe you've chosen to give your life to him. Uh, and we want to help you take those next steps. And uh, we want to meet you too. So I know some of our pastors are going to be down here at the New Here uh, banner down here. So we'd love to meet you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Invite a friend, bring a, a guest, and have a great week. We'll see you then.